Hi, everyone. Thank you for logging on with us today. We're just going to wait a couple more minutes, wait for a few more folks to sign on. Thanks. Hi everyone, welcome to the TBR webinar series. Today, Senior Analyst Boz Rostov, Senior Analyst Alisa Baklova, and Research Analyst Kelly Lozuska will be discussing survival tips in the era of automation-enabled service delivery. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping notes. At the bottom of your screens, you'll see a series of buttons. From the left to right, you can access the slides, audio controls, Q&A, speaker bios, and our survey. After the event, you will receive an email with the replay link as well as a link to view other TBR webinars. If you have any questions for us, please submit them via the Q&A widget in ON24. You may also reach out to us after the event at webinars at tbri.com. Thank you again for joining us. Here's Alisa to begin the webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Today, uh during the webinar, we'll, we'll provide you details with key insights from two recent publications, TBR's 4Q17 IT Services Vendor Benchmark and our 4Q17 Global Delivery Benchmark. The two reports collectively cover 29 vendors uh, from the IT services segment, and we have the listed, uh, listed the vendors here on this slide. The ones that are in bold are the ones that overlap for both reports. Um, before we dive into the details and, and into our assessment from the, t from the two reports, let me just give you a quick overview of how TBR does its analysis. We use a vendor-led approach and we closely track the listed vendors. And while we track them on a quarterly basis, we build our expertise around each one of them. We have an established knowledge base and a database around vendor strategies, their portfolios, their business models, and financial performance. So when we benchmark the vendors, we use a mix of qualitative uh, and quantitative assessments to draw comparisons. Uh, we have an extended list of metrics that we use, and you'll see some of the metrics here in this presentation. So to call out the leaders and the laggards and to rank them against each other, we split the data into different segments, um, such as service lines, geographies, uh, vertical industries. And we also use vendor groups uh, to compare and contrast the leaders and the laggards among each, uh, each vendor category. Next slide, please. Now let's start with the, with the questions. We, we uh, listed three key questions that we want to go over, uh, over with you today. Number one, how does the IT services market look after the end of 2017? What are the key headcount trends during 2017? 
and what were the KPIs to consider as vendors adopt an automation-enabled cost operating structure. On slide five, we start with a view of the IT services revenue. And um, just before I start, this is a view for the 29 vendors in the IT services benchmark. So all the data is related to the list of vendors that I showed you. Um, the TTM revenue growth for the 29 vendors uh, slightly accelerated in 4Q17 when we compare to the previous quarter, 3Q17. So sequentially, we have a, a slight improvement um, in, in revenue growth trends for the vendors. While growth was lower than the peak growth rate in 4Q16, it was significantly better than the decline that was re recorded in 4Q15. So effectively, we tend to see uh, an accelerating uh, trend over the past two years. And this uh, uh, past year was a trend of relatively stable performance for the 29 vendors. Um, we think that the, um, the state of the IT services market and the performance for the 29 vendors will remain relatively stable. There will be some acceleration during 2018. Um, but growth will still remain in the low, low single digits. We don't expect significant uptick in the trend. The key drivers for this growth will be um, um, portfolio uh, trend changes from the vendors. Uh, during the past uh, year or so, many of the vendors in the benchmark have invested in um, uh, changing their uh, portfolio mix in favor of next generation solutions. Uh, and this is playing very well for some of the vendors that uh, started early on to change their portfolios and move away from uh, traditional IT services. Uh, in addition to that, they have began reskilling their employees internally and training them on, on uh, new technologies and next generation solutions so that they can address demand. Um, so effectively now they have the bench to, uh, to address uh, clients' needs as they scale their uh, transformational initiatives. And we've seen uh, several of the vendors transforming their, sale, their sales organizations to be more efficient, um, to, uh, to push, uh, uh, to build uh, client relationships, to cross-sell solutions across the um, new and existing technology. So sales uh, uh, signings are building up, the pipelines are growing, and we anticipate more positive development for IT services revenue growth in uh, 2Q18 and going forward during, throughout the year. On next slide, um, we show um, the positioning of the 29 vendors in the benchmark, uh, in the IT services benchmark, um, and we're, we've plotted them based on uh, revenue growth, operating margin, and the size of the bubble is their revenue for, for the full year 2017. So this is a TTM basis graph. Uh, as you can see, it's a very mixed picture in terms of performance. Um, on the top right quadrant, uh, we have the vendors that lead in profitability, such as the India-centric firms that benefit from their low-cost delivery models. Uh, Cisco is up, up high um, in the operating margin rank. Uh, it benefits from the channel-centric delivery. It's a very specific model for that company, and that's why it's uh, so much higher than the rest of the pack. Um, DXT technology, entity data, um, and WNS are, um, are the outliers in terms of growth, and this is m largely because of the um, acquisitions that the three companies did in the past year, they're still being integrated, so it's, uh, it's causing a, a, lot, a, a rather large effect on uh, the revenue growth from an inorganic standpoint. Um, and then on, on the other uh, end, we have other companies that are um, also growing very well, um, such as Accenture, Capgemini, Atos, uh, uh, really growing, growing well in terms of developing its portfolio around next generation solutions and also adding in tuck-in acquisitions um, to expand capabilities uh, around next generation uh, technologies. And also Atos is building its um, presence in North America. So we've seen some expansion 
from an acquisition standpoint, um, um, building in, into that company's growth, and we see it growing um, uh, much higher um, than uh, its uh, European contender, Capgemini. Um, the laggards, on the other hand, the, on, the, on the left side, uh, bottom side of the, of the graph, uh, they're still challenged uh, largely by the fact that uh, they're ingrained in traditional IT services. They see a lot of price pressure and um, um, competitive pressures from, uh, um, from vendors. So they, they haven't been able to expand their portfolios on time and to change to, uh, to innovate the portfolios, to change to next generation solutions. So they're still uh, trapped into that, in, into that um, um, traditional IT services growth pressure. So that, that's why we see T-Systems, Unisys, for example, um, um, conduit in, in that um, uh, laggards uh, quadrant. And uh, in terms of um, uh, operating margin, it's the same story. They they have been they haven't been able to transform on on time and change their high cost uh, onshore centric operating models for Unisys and T systems specifically, and been not been able to get the, the above the the average for revenue and for operating margin. With this, I'll turn it over to Boz for our next slide. Thank you, Lisa, and uh, good afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Um, so kind of shifting gears uh, towards the, the second part of the, the presentation um, in terms of uh, uh, where is the headcount? I mean, the services uh, business, uh, while automation and other new technologies are um, impairing and kind of changing some of the delivery models, a lot of uh, the services still require the human uh, interaction, uh, from human design to uh, application services, support and maintenance, do still require uh, um, the, the human touch in a sense of where um, uh, vendors are staffing, how are they doing it, um, what's the pace of, uh, of uh, accelerating um, headcount growth or decelerating and so forth. So um, the graph that we have on the slide here is um, it's really a representation, it's a timeline of the, the two major um, metrics when we talk about um, services business headcount and revenue. In the past, uh, as you, most of you know, um, it has been a linear uh, the direction and when it comes to um, the labor arbitrage as a key lever of driving uh, services business. Your revenue performance is tied to your headcount growth performance and so forth. For many years, however, vendors have been trying to decouple that trend. And over the last, uh, the last second part of 2017, we started noticing uh, that trend actually becoming a reality, and we call it out um, as the non-linearity non uh, in the vendor performance is uh, uh, certainly something we want to uh, kind of keep an eye on and keep a, a really um, a long-term view of where and how sustainable that trend will be as automation uh, permeates a little bit more and becomes more aggressive, especially on the lower level tasks of service delivery like L1, L2 support and different service lines. Um, uh, what we notice uh, as, as a fact is that while vendors are uh, still hiring, uh, the growth tapered off in terms of headcount. Uh, a lot of the focus uh, has shifted towards uh, reskilling uh, employees, uh, really um, using the bench uh, that vendors actually have on hand, on staff, uh, they're able to get them through different training programs, uh, different certification programs that they can uh, able to, they're able to um, uh, operate in more of a of a hybrid based uh, environment um, and uh, kind of between a hybrid cloud and a traditional on, on prem or versus you know a pure uh, cloud environment. Um, a lot of vendors kind of um, cite some of their uh, digital related revenues and you know the, the spectrum range from anywhere from 25 to over 55 percent of their revenue um, uh, comes from a digital related activities. But when you kind of start um, dig a little bit more under the hood of what those numbers look like. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a trend we see that still a lot of those engagements have a little bit of a, a, good, a good chunk of a legacy business. And therefore, uh, uh, vendors must uh, retain a lot of that stuff able to support those existing engagements because it's still really driving and moving kind of the needle for, for a lot of the vendors. And uh, therefore, uh, it's kind of a balancing act between reskilling and supporting existing engagements uh, without at the same time, you have to be, uh, think about how our profitability gets impacted as uh, those vendors invest a little bit more into developing an IP and uh, some of the R&D uh, budgets for some of the vendors may be uh, moving up a little bit. Um, 
uh, you know, uh, comparing to a historical historical level. So uh, it is certainly a trend we wanted to call out uh, from nonlinear perspective. Uh, we expect uh, that trend to uh, sustain. As, as Liz pointed out, the revenue is kind of have been on, a, on an upswing trajectory uh, overall uh, for some of those vendors. So um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a trend that um, long term will have a, a really um, strong impact uh, on uh, driving profitable growth, not just uh, linear growth as it's been in the past. Um, and as uh, we move on to the next slide, uh, essentially um, uh, what we want to kind of get a little bit deeper is uh, that discussion around uh, digital transformation and what are the service lines, what are the core service lines, how do they get uh, shifted when you look at the headcount uh, vendors. So the, the five different sets of bar graphs, uh, bars here uh, really represent um, historical, like a year ago, uh, 2016 was 2017, and want to kind of take a look at where actually the hiring has happened, uh, where are the service lines that happened. The, the two of the, the major service lines that um, we see as a, as a trend is uh, consulting assistance integration application services. It's probably no surprise to many of you uh, when it comes down to, as we know, a lot of those vendors, and it's a point that a lot of vendors have been investing in innovation centers and, and uh, design facilities where uh, helps them to drive more of that uh, human, uh, human based interaction and kind of be a little more, uh, um, you know, how is it impacting the rest of the business? Where is it going? Building, is the building, building um, uh, physical presence? Um, you know, uh, helping to address that concurrent demand of both um, design-led discussions and application modernization initiatives. So those two service lines still demand uh, folks with the uh, skills in uh, design thinking and uh, application services and so forth, but also I need to kind of uh, uh, caution some of the vendors as they've been investing is how do they, um, how do they manage, uh, how do they measure the return on investment of, of, those, uh, of those centers. So we believe uh, that measuring is, 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 is still a challenge uh, because essentially what it does is it changes the way or it has to make vendors change how they think about their cost operating structure. What does it require? It's the, the SG&H uh, expense changes, the cost of services changes, uh, and the reshuffle of traditional software pyramid uh, operating structure versus uh, so a, a software pure services organization uh, operating structure. So. Uh, these are elements that uh, could have a, um, an impact, again, on the top, top and bottom line for the vendors. One way to think about those investments in energy staff, uh, the centers, is um, so a lot of those uh, vendors have had experience with <clears throat> centers of excellence. Um, and, uh, you know, centers of excellence to them are, are like a ubiquitous way of, like, thinking about how those vendors are driving business and really about, especially around the industry-specific uh, solutions, and so forth. So um, I think vendors have to be really um, uh, wary of uh, where, um, how the, the shift of uh, CapEx from the real estate investment of those physical facilities uh, into a more of a um, OPEX to better uh, account for the automation enabled service delivery. So um, those service lines, I mean, we see ITO service line as well uh, having a positive movement. Um, right now, uh, uh, that trend from an ITO perspective is all around um, the managed services, and uh, there's kind of becomes a little bit of a gray area between um, a pure ITO service line where it was a historical, or there's actually um, many services around the application layer that actually requires uh, also people to support, especially uh, when those vendors operate in a hybrid IT. So uh, we're keeping a closer eye on the ITO because I believe from the uh, IT services uh, perspective, the traditional ITO uh, revenue uh, is actually being uh, declining. So it's kind of like that no linearity that I, that I talked about earlier for overall is really not uh, as, uh, as the pace um, where it should be uh, for ITO particular, um, you know, because the revenue is declining, expanding. So it's, uh, um, it's that shift between resources and, and um, between the service lines when you rescue a resource that had a traditional just a software services background now into are you managing the infrastructure, are you managing actually the, the application layer. So, um, uh, it's, uh, we see that moving back and forth and uh, it has a, the impact uh, on the performance of those. Again, this is for a specific set of uh, vendors, but they do represent a large chunk of, uh, of uh, uh, when it comes to the headcount, uh, those 14 vendors in the benchmark um, uh, employ over 2 million people worldwide, so they certainly represent a good chunk of the market when it comes down to where the trends and how trends are moving. Um, 
So that's kind of like the, the second part, where the headcount uh, trends are, um, how we think about uh, hiring, reskilling, so what are the new areas, service, uh, um, agile-based service delivery um, is uh, kind of tying back to what we discussed around um, overall revenue performance and, and uh, where things are moving from an IT services perspective in terms of legacy business, moving into more uh, of so-called new areas that still require a, a fair amount of support of existing uh, service engagements. Um, moving on to the next kind of a, um, well, I think we moved one, one two slide too far. Uh, so we can just move back. Um, thank you. The, the third part of the, the, the presentation, it really is uh, kind of touch base a little bit about the profitability. And it's certainly a, a question we, we get fairly frequently from uh, clients, from vendors, um, you know, from just kind of overall the community. Uh, how is automation helping about profitability? What is really uh, happening? Is it really, are, the, are the vendors really absorbing some of those benefits? Um, um, what are the trends across service lines? Uh, and kind of think, uh, may help them think about it. Because we hear different numbers from, uh, from vendors that certain elements of their, um, of their uh, service delivery has been automated, uh, rescheduling stuff and so forth. So um, the vendor, the kind of like that uh, graph right now, it's really showing up um, uh, it's, it's an uh, additional view to the, um, the, the revenue and, and headcount performance, and we plotted along the way the average uh, profitability for all these 14 vendors. And as you can see, the, the, the red thread line uh, suggests that the profitability starts to uh, start to improve, uh, comparing to about a year or two years ago kind of a, a comparison. However, we still see um, that it's still in kind of um, in the range. I would say um, the historical uh, historical levels uh, about 12 to 14 percent on average uh, for uh, most of the vendors who you know that uh, you know participate in the benchmark style that's kind of on average. What we think it's happening is that uh, some of the early benefits of the automation are being kind of offset some of the investments in R&D, uh, investments in onshore personnel, with uh, some of the investments in the uh, in design facilities, um, and really. Um, uh, vendors are not really able to capitalize uh, on really on the driving factor of how do they monetize the development of IP, where do they go, and how do they position themselves from a pure services organizations to a more of an automation-enabled services as, as a services uh, firms. Um, what we see here, um, two trends. So we know the India vendors, uh, historically, they have had the largest uh, kind of a, the, a profitability when it comes to the percentage of their revenue. They've been hovering 20 to 25%. Uh, you know, on, on average, um, we think they need to start, um, and we see some of them start like really uh, pairing back on their profitability range and guidance expectations uh, with their stakeholders. Uh, they are certainly uh, understanding that if they want to play the digital game, they need to be a little more aggressive with the innovation span. They need to be um, um, really driving, uh, uh, investing for growth. So it is a, it is a must for them, uh, you know, to uh, start doing that. We know Cognizant has that kind of been their policy for a while. We see emphasis uh, with the new CEO, kind of um, that's kind of on his agenda. They just pared down the range of percentage point um, from what's historical. Tonight. We think that um, they probably going to have to do or they're going to do um, a little bit more than just one percentage point in order to accelerate their performance. But then we see other other, other vendors on the other spectrum that have actually been benefiting from automation and some of their legacy performance, like vendors like with European heritage, like Capgemini and Atos, for example, that um, they know how to manage uh, services organizations in a strict labor law environment. So that heritage helps them to be a little bit better positioned when it comes down to cost operating structure and seeing profitability improving for those vendors and actually uh, moving into the double-digit, uh, uh, you know, uh, range and closer to those 12 to 14 uh, percent on, on average for the rest of the vendors. So that heritage of managing talent uh, and human resources in a tight labor law environment, such as Europe, uh, certainly has helped them. Uh, Capgemini has invested largely in uh, India-centric uh, facilities. Atlas, however, has been investing really strongly in automation-enabled uh, 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 services, especially around the um, ITO and managed services, uh, kind of like the 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 the, the, the legacy of um, service lines, but they also been investing aggressively into the digital transformation factory as well as the ITO capabilities uh, that are, that are part of it. So it's uh, you see that uh, two sets of companies essentially 
um, on each side of the spectrum. You know, also we have IBM and Accenture uh, in the mix as well that uh, kind of a lot of those vendors uh, look at them, how they move, when they move, and how they move and how they operate because it's kind of like from the skill that they offer um, uh, broadly in the IT services space. So they're kind of like in that um, mid-range uh, profitability point and that they've been managing that profitability for a while now. Um, so that's kind of like a really uh, the takeaway really here is about automation and profitability is about it is starting to happen, but there's also other elements and variables to consider, especially with uh, investing in on-site resources and investing in IP. It's a matter of how you position yourself, how you message yourself, and um, how do you get the buy-in internally uh, from, the org from the organizational leadership. Um, as we think about um, organization, um, when you say we're, we're doing digital XYZ services, is, are you as an organization actually, um, uh, as a vendor, uh, doing those changes internally? I have you transform your operation internally uh, in terms of digital. So uh, that, that's a key part of that moving uh, uh, towards more of an automation enabled service uh, delivery structure. So that's kind of uh, the view of the benchmarks uh, that we have wanted to kind of share. We have one more slide as part of the presentation uh, to touch upon. It's really about how we start thinking about um, what's next uh, in the service delivery and what are some of the uh, metrics uh, that uh, we are looking into um, and we <clears throat> kind of touched on a little bit uh, already on uh, some of those, uh, uh, you know, as examples and, and metrics, but um, RPA is, and that's kind of the, the, the common denominator, but we, we're thinking about RPA as that uh, common uh, technology tool that's able to help them with some of the like, low-level tasks for vendors to perform better, to improve profitability, and so forth. So, but along the way, we need to kind of start tracking innovation span that includes both investments in R&D, uh, investments in innovation facilities, um, and, and so forth. Uh, M&A uh, is part of it as well. Certain uh, certain uh, elements, certain vendors are still adding on uh, horizontal uh, breadth. Um, others are uh, uh, adding more of a vertical depth, but it, it depends uh, which vendor is stacking up. So um, the FTE workload equivalent uh, is certainly a metric. Uh, you know, some of the vendors that we have had a couple, like instances in Repro, have started reporting those metrics of uh, of where um, they're trending. Um, it is a it is a metric that uh, uh, could provide a good benchmarking view uh, for vendors to understand when they rescue stuff or uh, kind of provide that uh, additional view of the equation. Automation is doing X for our firm in terms of um, save cost savings, but what do we do with the stuff? That's kind of like do we rescue them? Do we do we uh, position them like from BPO support function? Do we train those folks and become an application software uh, experts? In a, a specific uh, domain area, so that kind of uh, work uh, workflow equivalent is, is certainly a good metric to think about automation of how it changes your organization internally, but also um, you know it uh, uh, provides a, a, a longitude view into where things uh, where else are moving. Um, the RPA cost, the RPA ROI, is certainly uh, elements everyone wants to know about, um, and uh, we think that. Um, um, for the most, you know, vendors, you know, the, the, the numbers, the reporting on staff reskilling is, is, is part of that. Um, in terms of the technology cost, uh, license, configuration, maintenance, and IT infrastructure is certainly among the, the top um, attributes that vendors are, um, you know, thinking about and considering as they invest um, in, uh, in uh, those uh, new areas. Um, this is more to kind of help you think and position that slide here as a, um, as we think about IT services um, uh, space evolving and automation being really part of it, uh, I know, no, you know, it's certainly here to stay. Um, what are some of the benchmarking metrics uh, as vendors, as, as clients, um, to think about? And some of you have adopted some of those KPIs into and some of them uh, others, but we're trying to see as a TBR, as a third party view of um, what can we do and what are the benchmarking opportunities and how you best understand. because. You think about, we talked in the beginning, linearity and labor arbitrage, certainly um, uh, low cost leverage as it correlates to profitability is a, is a key metric to understand how things are moving um, across service lines. But now with automation, there's other KPIs that uh, we are um, uh, starting to explore uh, and starting looking into uh, from our research perspective, um, you know, uh, which vendors are investing in which areas. So 
certainly open for feedback uh, on those KPIs. Uh, we don't think they're all inclusive, but certainly we have uh, conversations with clients um, around those, and we, we're gathering kind of a fielding some of the research areas that we think um, will help with that kind of what's next of like global delivery 2.0, so to speak, uh, for uh, for a lot of those uh, for the, those vendors. So. Um, I'll kind of that's kind of I'll leave that as as a wrapper open up for questions uh, on the uh, you know folks on the line. Um, so, um, do you have any questions on the line? Yeah, you know, uh, this is, um, Mr. Patrick, if you do have any questions, please um, use the, the little box here and send them in. And we have a few already, so we'll take the rest of the time now to, to go over some of those questions. Uh, the first one that came in: Can you summarize the effect of cloud? Uh, on different IT services segments? Uh, it's a good question because it's gonna, cloud's going to affect everything and we could go an entire webinar on cloud. Um, yeah. but Alisa, do you want to take the first stab at that? Uh, sure. Cloud really is advancing and uh, it's really um, cutting across many of the service lines for many of the vendors. So we've seen the ramp up in the effect in the past year. And uh, just thinking about cloud, I, you know, there are several items that I can certainly call out. I think the, the, um, a key impact on cl uh, of cloud on, on IT services is on the upfront consulting and uh, integration part. So our consulting and systems integration line uh, has been, um, has has been seeing uh, uh, an increased activity around advisory uh, and implementation services as clients adopt cloud, especially around hybrid IT models. So how, uh, you know, advising clients how they will implement and how they can integrate the, their legacy environments with, with cloud. So that's definitely a service line that has been positively affected by, by the advent of cloud. And, uh, you know, I, I can call out um, Accenture here in, in this segment, uh, a very good example of a company that's been building its uh, consulting and systems integration capabilities around cloud, either through organic investments or through several acquisitions uh, in the space um, to be able to build, run, and manage hybrid environments. But specifically, very strong um, for this company is the consulting expertise. Uh, I would say. Um, the other segment is application services. So um, we see legacy applications are being replatformed. Um, they're moved uh, to cloud, uh, and effectively that's driving um, a demand for, for, help, for support from IT services vendors. Uh, clients are adopting software as a service. Sometimes uh, clients require uh, customizations around software as a service. So, those are gen those needs are generating application services opportunities for vendors. Um, if I think of a vendor, IBM comes to my mind as an example. IBM really has an, a, a very uh, big uh, legacy software install base, so uh, there's quite a lot of uh, activities going into um, modernization of uh, legacy applications and moving it, migrating in them to cloud. Um, software as a service customization is also uh, one area for IBM um, as it works to customize partner apps. Um, so that, that kind of drives application services work for IBM around, uh, around this area. Um, the last uh, but not least, of course, is the infrastructure services. So we see uh, a lot of activity coming on the managed services side around uh, um, the, the necessity to uh, move away and help, and, you know, help with complexity of, of managing hybrid cloud uh, environments. Um, and Atlas is a, is a really good example in, in this segment. Uh, we've seen this company um, expand its capabilities around um, managed services uh, and using its uh, traditional uh, managed services expertise and integrating it with uh, orchestrated hybrid cloud capabilities um, to um, to expand in, in the managed services segment, so that's that's really one area, and we've seen uh, other vendors moving into into that. You know, wanting to be um, orchestrators uh, of um, client hybrid IT environments. 
Excellent. Um, thank you, Elisa. Anything else to add to that, boss? I think she, she exhausted pretty well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so another question has come in. How would you characterize the current maturity of automation KPIs? Are any firms more open than others in benchmarking automation? So I'll just tell you. Um, that's a good question. So um, I think, uh, you know, we, like I said, we, we have had uh, various conversations, uh, um, you know, with, uh, with the vendors, the vendor community, and trying to understand where they are. Um, uh, Vendors like um, I think some of the vendors are a little more um, uh, internally trans have transformed themselves uh, and, and they're doing a lot of things, kind of being digital, so to speak, uh, like uh, Accenture and um, uh, up to some extent, and some a little bit of IBM. They, these are folks that have started doing things uh, on, in their internal organization um, that help them to. Um, it, it helps them to think different about automation and, and where, where things are. Um, some of the industry centric vendors, they uh, are a, a lot about automation, uh, but I think it's also, um, I think going back to my initial comments, they have to rethink their culture of being profit first, uh, kind of uh, internally, and how they uh, message that to the state, their own stakeholders. Uh, I think that if they get able to um, change that perception, I think they'll be able to accelerate um, how they think about automation and where um, their KPIs are and how we can help uh, assist them with um, the certain um, KPI metrics um, that we have suggested and certainly um, they bring to the table as well on their end as well. Excellent. So another question has come in, um, and this one's more back to the IT services space more specifically. <clears throat> what are the drivers for leaders in operating margin? What challenges are the laggards facing? How do India-centric vendors profitability? How are India-centric vendors profitability impacted by business model changes? So, Lisa Kelly, who's going to take that one first? Hi, uh, this is Kelly. I can start off with that one. Uh, so, to start with, um, I can start with the drivers um, for the leaders in the operating margin. A lot of the or mo the drivers primarily. Um, I would say are a combination of low-cost leverage um, combined with automation, AI-driven tools embedded within their service delivery models, uh, similar to what Boz was speaking about before. And then also um, a more efficient and integrated SG&A model, as well as the globally integrated delivery model, similar to Cisco with its channel partners, and um, it benefits also from its support and maintenance contracts, which helps it stay at the top of the operating margin leaders. Uh, shifting to the laggards a little bit, um, some of the larger vendors such as IBM and Fujitsu, they're facing a lot of pressure from the lower profit contracts. Um, Fujitsu, for instance, they've um, noted in their earnings calls that they're suffering from some unprofitable contracts, which is lowering their profitability. Um, I think it's partially from uh, their shifting into different areas um, where we've said a little bit earlier that part of their uh, digital engagements are still filled with a lot of legacy, so I think shifting over and then also just trying to accelerate adoption of their um, newer technologies is impacting their profitability where they may not be as profitable as they were before as they're just trying to update. Um, and then some of the challenges for the laggards, um, a lot of them are impacted by lingering restructuring and associated costs such as T-Systems and Unisys as well as um, onshore investments and high-cost service delivery is increasing their overall delivery. Um, moving on to the India-centric question, um, most of the vendor, the India-centric vendors, while they're still in the top um, for margins, they're definitely facing a lot of pressures as they're shifting their business models. Um, instead of being mostly low-cost based, a lot of them are investing in their onshore resources. Um, such, so, for instance, Infosys has announced that they're establishing their technology and innovation hubs throughout the U.S. and then um, combined with reskilling, which is similar to Wipro, who is reskilling their employees as well as investing in their co-innovation and delivery facilities in um, onshore regions. So, shifting their delivery models to onshore and reskilling their existing employees is really impacting their profitability and I think we'll see their impact in the short in the short term as they begin shifting over. 
Yeah, this is Patrick. I would add, and, and actually our report on Wipro uh, comes out today, um, and one of the things that you'll see in there is how they, um, they're they taking a bet, they're making a, a big risk, a risky bet on um, how they're going to be able to shift their whole business and their, their operating model. And, um, and the thing about taking a risky bet is you need to move fast. Uh, or else you're going to suffer um, from being too slow to the party. And I think Wipro is a little bit slow right now. So I think the odds are that the, the impact on profitability for them is probably going to be sustained longer than with some of the other India-centric vendors. Um, the nice thing about that is it actually gives us a reason to talk about the Indians in different ways, because I think they, they're finally beginning to shake out so that the differences among them are, are starting to become greater than some of the similarities. Um, so we have another question that's come in. Why does increased automation lead to price reduction, price pressure? It seems counterintuitive uh, for a provider value proposition unless a client associates value with FTE. All things equal, increased automation should lead to higher service provider margins. Boz, this is all you. That's a good question. Um, so it's uh, certainly a, um, a question we get often. Um, what we think uh, what's happening actually right now is that um, the reward, the award side, uh, that uh, automation is a factor, um, are not at the scale um, that um, vendors would fall back into the, the legacy IT contract. Um, what's really, uh, what's really um, happening is that um, when vendors go to marketing, they're like, well, we have automation too, right? And we can save you, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Client, X amount of dollars because we have embedded automation in our service delivery. Client's expectation is that you want to lower the price point right now because you're saying, um, well, it took you um, 10 billable hours for uh, $400 an hour to deliver uh, X engagement. Now you're telling me that you can actually do that in two hours. Um, so am I paying $2,000 per hour? What happens? I should be paying four hundred dollars an hour. So, in a sense, that actually puts a little bit more pressure right now because actually the the reward, the the engagement side, it's much smaller, and that requires a higher volume, higher transaction in terms of when it comes down to um, automation only kind of a, a, the deals that are actually being given. And that it's a, it's a, again fine balance of messaging, what you do as a firm, and how automation changes your go to market. And, and how you position and pitch that to the client um, uh, when it comes down to um, uh, the service engagement levels and, and, and how we get charged. Excellent. All right. Um, well, I hope that, that question was satisfactorily answered. Um, so moving on, we got one last question uh, today, and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, and this is about as broad as question as it gets. Um, what are key trends by service line in, and we're back to IT services. So IT services broadly, what are some of the key trends by service line? At least I, I think that's probably in your wheelhouse, right? Uh, yes, Patrick. Um, from a service line standpoint, uh, we break revenue for the 29 vendors by uh, five service lines. Um, so we have uh, consulting and systems integration. I am... Um, applications outsourcing, um, ITO, BPO, and um, other services, which is the support around uh, hardware maintenance. Um, so when you take a look at the service lines, um, two of the service lines are really doing well, while two are uh, still, uh, three actually, are still challenged are, uh, in, in their performance. Um, and there is a widening gap, and we've seen that gap, um, you know, still there uh, in terms of the performance during 2017. Um, consulting and systems integration and ITO both uh, positively affected and, and growing, growing relatively well. Uh, and then BPO and ITO uh, revenues declining, and that has been a trend for over a year now um, among the lines. Um, the leading the leading line in terms of growth is applications uh, outsourcing. I think the benefit there, and I kind of talked about it um, before, but it's really the relevance to cloud modernization and digital transformation as well. 
so that's really um, helping the line um, um, improve revenue growth. And we've seen the vendors um, utilize their existing application services uh, client base and uh, help them modernize. So there's quite a lot of cross-selling cross going on in, in that service line, and it's been positively uh, affected on the revenue side. Um, consulting and systems integration is the next line that, uh, that's um, growing, um, growing in 4217. Um, and it's both consulting uh, being um, business consulting and IT consulting, so that's necessary to, um, that expertise is necessary to transform clients' uh, business models through advanced technologies. And we've seen many of the vendors expanding their portfolios and um, adding onshore people uh, both in Europe and in North America to have the consulting uh, experts that know the business, that know the industries, that know the architectures and infrastructure to uh, combine all those capabilities and be close to the client, collaborate when they develop solutions. So, um, and then go ahead and implement them through their systems integration capabilities. So that's been really driving the performance in the service line. And then on the other spectrum, we have BPO and ITO. They still uh, continue to experience growth challenges. Um, and that still will be the case in, in, in 1Q18, is my sense. Um, ITO um, really has been challenged by commoditization. Um, smaller deal sizes, we no longer see the large-scale long-term uh, ITO deals. So. Um, that's been, uh, you know, a challenge. Pricing pressures uh, exist as well for, for those that are uh, in the traditional IT outsourcing segment and they haven't diversified their portfolios. Uh, so now as vendors are, are moving um, into new solutions, they're providing automation-enabled environments, uh, um, orchestration of cloud environments um, to increase the value for clients. They're also adding security and networking capabilities to be more relevant to address, um, you know, current requirements uh, uh, from clients. Uh, that, that activity is picking up speed. And we've seen many vendors um, call out deals with clients uh, around the new uh, next generation solutions adoption and management. But it has to gain scale, and um, that activity has not been able yet to upset the declines in traditional IT services areas. Um, and for BPO, um, it's, it's, it's a decreasing revenue trend, um, and we've seen uh, the vendors still um, trying to balance between human-delivered BPO services and platforms and automation uh, offering as a services solutions to improve their revenue perform performance uh, and manage costs. Um, they're adding analytics in the, in the mix as well and industry specialized solutions, so higher value for, for the client. Um, but we still haven't seen the, the improvement in the performance in the BPO space. Excellent, thanks Lisa. So that's all we've got uh, in the Q&A you, and so I don't um, have anything else to ask, but uh, I do know that next week's webinar uh, will be delivered by Boz and Stuart, I yes. guess, right? If you want to, Boz, you want to explain to folks what's coming up next week? Yes, sure. I mean, uh, certainly next week we're back in New Hampshire. Uh, this week we're sitting in uh, Atlas's uh, BTIC uh, facility here in Dallas, Texas, um, and we're back up in the Northeast to, to deliver a webinar around digital marketing and advertising technology. Um, so two of the core transformation areas of digital transformation, because it's that front office that uh, vendors are trying to uh, pitch uh, work around uh, to their clients, um, and actually we're going to deliver uh, insights from our customer research and kind of share what clients are expecting uh, from vendors uh, around digital marketing services, what are the capabilities, how are the, how are the budget being uh, allocated um, and really getting a, a good feel where is that digital marketing uh, market uh, essentially on the maturity curve uh, as we think about the virus personas as vendors try to target uh, the CMO uh, and they're trying to engage uh, in a new, um, well, it's not very new these days anymore, but an area that they have not done uh, work historically, which has been IT, now it's a little bit more marketing kind of business. 
type of uh, services. So uh, stay tuned. It's going to be the same time a week from today, uh, 1, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. So uh, Stuart and I will be talking about that. This will be quite as nice a facility for you. This has been a lot of fun to be here at the uh, the Atos Tech in Dallas. Yeah, um, it's been really nice, and we need, this needs to be a, a recurring thing. We need to go to all the uh, all yeah. the experience centers, all the digital transformation yeah. customer collaboration centers, and deliver our webinars from there. It's been pretty fun. Yeah. So, all right, I think that's it, Sarah. I know there are some closing comments, right? Yep. Um, all right, everyone, please feel free feel free to reach out to the team with any follow up questions. If you have a few moments, please fill out the survey on your screen and let us know what topics you'd like to see us cover in the future. A replay version of the webcast will be available after the event, which you will receive via email, as well as a link to view and register for other TBR webinars. Thanks for joining, and have a great day.